Pro tip, whenever or wherever you have a dial indicator set up, especially if a tense indicator, make sure to tap everything. Go tap crazy. Make pretend you're trying to make a younger sibling cry. Everyone will assume you're a professional. broke my hip coming through that doorway. How about you and I get comfortable? Wait, I messed that up. How about you and I get out of our comfort zones? This thing is a Beta Evo, EVO, Evo. It's a 125cc. Not a big engine, but a fun bike. Attentive viewers may have noticed I didn't wheelie into that intro for two reasons. Second, this engine has lost some power. Cut to the chase, we're gonna have to crack her open and take a look at the piston cylinder and piston rings. I'm almost positive it's a compression issue. Did I say that out loud already? I really wanted it to not be. I went through and I removed the carburetor, cleaned that, fuel filter, air filter, took out and cleaned those little reedy valve things. None of that really helped. The whole time, in the back of my head, I knew it was the compression. I mean, I don't wanna to speak too soon. That's the point of this exercise. We're gonna open it up and just check everything. If nothing else, we'll get a good look at how this thing's been treated. Before we all rush down into the comments, I've already changed both brake rotors. That didn't fix it. My first clue was just how easy this thing is to kick over. I mean, I could do this by hand. I can sort of do it by hand. But again, I'm not 100%. Maybe you can kick over all 125s with your hand. Personally, mine is a 300cc engine, and that takes four simultaneous grown men to kick over. The smart thing to do would be to run a compression test on that cylinder, but I don't have a compression tester that I trust. Well, I do. I've got one of these Craftsman, I guess it's a Sears brand, compression tester for small engines. Well, I guess for any engine, technically. You get 300 PSI. But I can't easily get this into that spark plug position. You'd press this into the spark plug hole. This cone creates a seal. Kick it over, do that a million times, and see how much compression you build. I did think about making an adapter for this, just making some plumbing to get into that space that I do have. But again, that might have been a lot of work for naught. I have one of these things from Amazon, I think eBay, less than 30 bucks. Problem is I don't trust it. A good compression tester probably costs in the two to $300 range. I've used this a handful of times and always got weird numbers. Initially, I tried to debug it. These connectors are pretty chintzy. I figured it was leaking somewhere, but no avail. I did try this on this engine. It was telling me about 60 PSI, I think. And I could just tell even by hand, it's more than 60. This was measuring my bike at 90 and my bike's gotta be like 4,000. Buyer beware, I suppose. It's too good to be true. It probably is. Actually, it dawned on me that after I do whatever I do inside this engine, you, the viewer, will have no idea if things got better or things got worse. So despite not necessarily trusting this gauge, it might help to give you a reference. See what we get, and then we'll do this again after. I've taken the spark plug out and installed the compression tester in its place. Now I'm gonna kick this thing like it owes me money holding the throttle all the way open, and the kill switch is on. Can't get that past, I don't know, maybe 70 PSI, about five bar. An engine like this should probably be around 150, give or take. Yes, you're right. I really should have washed this first. I hope it goes without saying that this isn't a how-to video. I don't really consider myself an engines guy, but there's no way I'm paying someone else to do something I'm fully qualified to do after reading that one magazine article 15 years ago. I was expecting a little more coolant. It helps if you take the radiator cap off. I moved away some of the junk in this area just to make some space so I can work. Fan and radiator, some brackets. Now I think I can open her up. Taking the top off first, I think it's technically called the lid. My end game is to get the piston and the cylinder out and on the bench where we can take an intimate look at it and take some measurements. Uh, I guess it's more like the intermediate game. End game is to get this thing fixed. 
Ooh, would you look at that? There are no score marks in the cylinder wall that I can feel. It's an awful lot of junk in there though. I wonder if it's just worn piston rings. Is that wishful thinking? All right, let's get it out of there. So that's definitely blow by, I think anyway. The piston shouldn't be black below these piston rings or maybe as black, what do I know? Are those rings seized? No, top one's okay. No, bottom one's good too. They're still springy. I'm checking for twist. I'm trying to get a sense for how the bearings are doing in this thing. I see a little bit of scoring on the intake side. Let me get this out and I'll meet you back at the bench. Pistons, the tarot cards of the engine world. Ask 10 mechanics about this and you'll get 15 different answers. Can you make out the carbon buildup near the edges is shinier than that in the middle? That means the front tire pressure is low and or we're in for a wet summer. All right, I'm sorry, I'm being a little cheeky. There are some really good mechanics out there. I'm not one of those. But this is a textbook case of blow-by. How do I know? Well, I have a textbook with pictures and there's enough wear in these rings and or the cylinder bore that combustion gases are getting past them and maybe gearbox oil is getting up to the top, all of which results in a loss of power. Very little engine compression. This is why the Kickstarter felt so light. I see some long, very fine scratching too. These don't look like seizure marks to me, but again, I'm no expert. I'm willing to bet the air box is full of dirt and this engine is sucking some of that in. See what I did there? Snuck in a generalization to build your confidence in my predictive powers. All dirt bike air boxes are full of... I can't really know anything here unless I start to take some measurements. In order to do that, I need to get these parts cleaned up. Give me a minute, I'm just gonna head over to the bench grinder. I don't know why I still bother with that ultrasonic cleaner. It maybe softened some of this up, but I still had to scrub it by hand. Time to break down and buy the right detergent for that thing. This, the pin, and the cylinder are clean enough to take measurements. Before I do that, I just wanted to share this thing with you. This was a seized piston from a neighbor's weed eater, 30 or 35 cc. And here you can really see the scoring and the gouging. This was run, I think, without or with very little lubrification. Still two stroke. They either ran it with straight gas or did their math wrong and didn't put enough oil in there. Hopefully you can make that out, but that is pretty severe. I can more than feel those ridges. In comparison, it might look like this one's still doing pretty darn good, but let's take a closer look and see what the numbers say. Now if you squint your eyes, hopefully you can make out on your right hand side, you can still see the grooves from manufacturing. And here it becomes smooth and shiny where the wear has occurred. I'm wearing my optivisors and I'm going to try to strike a line where I see the turning marks disappear. So maybe somewhere in here, if I work my way around and do the same thing here. Just super shiny area up here. Down here is a little bit cooked. That's the exhaust side, I think. Yep. If you can't tell which side is which once you get this out of a bike or an engine, they're usually marked with an arrow. Let me see if that's still in frame. There's the arrow. That's the front or the exhaust side. If you can't find your arrow, maybe you accidentally took it off at the bench grinder or your engine is having some detonation issues and you have a gigantic hole in the top of your piston. You can check where the pins are in the piston grooves. How do I do this? There's a pin there for the piston ring and another pin there. These always go towards the back, towards the intake side, where your carburetor and your air box are. Technically, none of that was important, but we're going to be taking a measurement across the piston skirt front to back from about here to here. That's where the piston is wearing the most. It's attached to the crankshaft via the connecting rod at this pin, and it has sort of this degree of freedom. I mean, it can shuffle left and right a bit. The piston rings keep it centered, but the forces from combustion and the return force from the connecting rod tend to push this skirt into your cylinder wall. Now, fortunately, the bike manufacturer is kind enough to provide like a basic service manual. They tell you an accessible wear limit. Now here they're showing us a very specific area to measure on the piston skirt, some distance up from the bottom across the front and the back. You can see that's where the pin comes through. And in my case, 
For the 125cc model of this bike, I want to measure 11 and a half millimeters up from the bottom, and I have an A piston in there. It's labeled, it's stamped on the piston and the cylinder. My wear limit is 53.935 millimeters. Anything less than that, and the piston needs to be replaced. I've struck some small lines where that 11 and a half millimeter mark is from the bottom. I don't have a metric micrometer, so I converted the 53.935 millimeters to inches, which comes out to 2.1234. Not making that up, 2.1234. This piston is toast. Now that's only about two thou, or one thou per side, arguably. Is this thing still good? Technically, no. Could you get away with reinstalling it, but just replacing the piston rings? Maybe. I won't know until we check the cylinder bore, or the prices for new pistons. The engine cylinder. These things always scare me. First, we're measuring an internal bore, which is never fun. And second, anything out of spec here is usually pretty expensive to fix. Similar story, they're specking a depth at which to take a measurement. In this case, for the 125, I'm going down 10 millimeters. And for the A cylinder, my wear limit is 54.005. I've already taken the liberty to convert that, and our target is 2.16. Oops, 2.16. 1261, 2.1261. That's the wear limit. Anything bigger than that number is bad news bears. I don't have a dial bore gauge, but I have a telescopic gauge and a micrometer. Telescopic gauges have always been quite finicky. You do need to develop a bit of a feel to get these things to work properly, to get a real dimension rather. When I first started out, I used to keep things like bearings or just other junk with precision bores in them of different sizes and take repeated measurements on a known dimension with the snap gauge and a micrometer to develop the feel for that particular range maybe. You know, it's different if you're holding a one inch micrometer or a six inch micrometer. Again, I'm measuring front to back. I'm also at the limit between snap gauge sizes. I'm going to go into the bore. I like to snug it up a bit. Right now I'm targeting that 10 millimeter depth on one side. I'm just going to pull it through. I didn't like how that felt. I'm going to do that again. If you don't think I haven't taken this measurement already like 400 times before the camera started rolling, over 10 or so measurements, I'm getting 2.1264. So technically out of spec, but only three tenths. Some have been below that, some above that. I'm trying to measure tenths with a snap gauge. That dimension probably changes if you miss that 10 millimeter mark. But I've been beating myself up about this, and I'm going to call this cylinder good. Good enough. For those curious two people out there, Here's a look at the inside. There's the exhaust side. Doesn't look like the end of the world to me. I'm just shooting from the hip here. A new one of these probably set you back four or 500 clams, 550, and there's shipping of course. A new piston, maybe a hundred bucks, 120 bucks if you get a fancy one. All in if you're swapping both, at which point you'd probably change out, you know, bearings, piston rings of course, maybe the pin. I don't know, you can get expensive fast. It used to be you could bore these things out, throw this in the mill, center it up, bore out the wear, and install an oversized piston. Technically, you still can do that, but for better or for worse, these things have fancy coatings on the inside. This thing has like a clear sill or something in there. To get it recoded, you might be spending 150 bucks. Sure, it's cheaper than buying a whole new cylinder, but of course, it'll take some time. You gotta ship it out, they'll coat it, ship it back. Given what I'm seeing, and the fact that this isn't my bike, I'm gonna go with new piston and rings. By the way, I should mention, just for integrity's sake, that it's not smart to mix and match old and new parts. Like putting a new piston in an old cylinder, although technically might work, you're not gonna get the bang for your buck out of your new piston. In a way, you're sort of throwing money away trying to save money. Your new piston, or new part or whatever, will wear faster and in a funny way, not ha-ha funny. Just see this through, and because I have a spec for it, I have removed the piston rings. Piston rings, if I haven't said this already, are essentially like the seals in the engine, like the seal between the piston and the cylinder wall. Without these, you would have no compression and no power. Younger me got a little bit excited that it could have just been worn rings. And I think if you stay on top of your bike maintenance, you can probably change these out a few times before you get to this point, before you get to a worn piston. But who we kidding? Anyway, these are like snap rings. There's a special tool, piston ring pliers. They just have these little like wedge ends that you can come in up against the side of the piston 
and they'll pick up on the piston rings and you can remove them off the top. Sort of like that. Sorry I didn't show you taking them off. But to measure these, you remove them from the piston and you install them in the cylinder. You just sort of push them in there. It's important that it goes in there nice and square. Let's use the piston, put it in from the bottom, and use that to sort of square up the ring. That gap there is what we're trying to measure. Let me bring you in closer. According to the service manual, the wear limit is 0.6 millimeters. The more that ring wears, the larger that gap would become. Come in here with a feeler gauge. This is 0.6 millimeter, and you can see that piston ring is shot. That wear is more like two millimeters. Just for fun, and because I'm curious, I thought we'd take some more serious measurements of this cylinder. Although the service manual only provides one pass-fail dimension, front to back, 10 millimeters down, and best I can tell, the cylinder still appears to be pretty good. I mean, bumping up against that wear limit, but still technically good. Let's see if it's gone oval or tapered or who knows what. I'm set up on the mill table. I stoned and cleaned it um, up on some one, two, three blocks. And after two hours of pulling my hair out, finally centered in the bore. I'm using a tenths indicator. And although that might be fine if you're looking at a more worn cylinder, or maybe one of those older cast iron cylinders, at this point, I'm looking for changes in tenths of an inch. So ideally I'd want a millionths indicator. And as crazy as that sounds, fortunately, I don't own one of those. Just to preface what you're about to see, an increase in material will cause that indicator to move counterclockwise. An increase in material in this case means a tighter bore. So if I push this needle back, it goes counterclockwise. Let me try to zero this out again, but these things are impossible. Good enough for me. We're a tenth high. I can try to rotate the face, but it's going to make things worse. Oh, would you look at that? This is in a holder, the mill is out of gear, and I can turn the spindle by hand, sweeping the indicator around the bore. I've already centered this front to back. So it's set on zero at the front. If we swing it 180 degrees, it'll read zero at the back. Now I'm just gonna rotate it 90 degrees, and you're not gonna be able to read this, but if I get you in there close enough, you'll see that we picked up one tenth, maybe a smidge more, one and a half. That's two and a half thousandths of a millimeter. In the back, we should still be at zero, and if we swing over another 90 degrees, we pick up another tenth, tenth and a half. Though maybe that's two tenths. So one and a half on the left, one and a half or two on the right. That's probably three or three and a half total across the left right direction. Now remember that's tenths of a thousandth of an inch, which is like 0 0.007 millimeters. What does that mean? I have no idea. This thing has either worn remarkably cylindrical or it has very little to no wear in it. The handbook doesn't tell me right from the factory what this dimension should be. To continue the antics, I'm gonna drop the indicator down as far as I can, probably right before I hit the exhaust port. It won't tell you so in the manual, but swinging a tense indicator across an exhaust port is bad for the indicator. If that indicator now looks a little bit higher than it did in the previous shot where I was winding the table up, it's because I wound the table up, swung the indicator, and ran into the exhaust port. So I had to back it out a bit. I picked up a little bit of taper on the right hand side. I'd take that with a grain of salt. That's probably more due to the fact that I'm trying to use my milling machine as a CMM. But more interestingly, when I swing this, it goes from more or less zero, picks up a thou, or drops off a thou, and heads back to zero. In the back, there's also a thou. Had you not skipped ahead during the cylinder wear measurement, you'll notice that that's the same place that the piston has worn. Again, those torquey forces at the skirt. We've been throwing around a lot of numbers. Let's take a moment, step back, and consider the big picture. Numbers are a mathematical concept used to represent a quantity. Forget about engines. What we have here are two parts that need to move relative to each other. This piston needs to go up and down to do its thing. That means we need clearance between the two. We need some space in there. The manufacturer, who designed and built this engine, tells us the upper limit to that clearance, or that space between the two parts, for this size engine is two and a half thou, 0 0.06 millimeter. Will the engine stop working when it wears that far? No, no it won't. You could likely double that wear number and still have a great time on your bike. Of course, you'll gradually lose engine performance. And if it wears too far, and you end up with too much space in there, well, the bike might still run fine. I mean, it likely won't have any power, but it'll start and move you around maybe. But if it wears too far and it gets too much space, 
This piston could start to wiggle so much that it could break itself to pieces. It'll slap around in there so much these parts could crack. You might get a piece of your engine skirt down inside the crankcase, which would be catastrophic. Then instead of just a new piston or new rings, you're looking at a new engine. I have no idea where we left off, but it's now 15 years later. My kids have moved out. I'm on my third wife and the engine parts just showed up. Great. Now I've got the hiccup. I need to get this thing together. So I'm just going to do everything I did till now, only in reverse, but with a lot less talking or maybe reverse talking. <laughs> Though this was a kid, it actually came with a new wrist pin and snap ring. So I'll throw those in too. Before I do that though, there are three things I want to tell you. You thought you were going to get off easy, didn't you? First, I love you. Second, I'm going to double check the new piston ring gap, just like we did before. Install them in the cylinder and use a feeler gauge. Though in this case, it's more of a sanity check that the ends don't collide. But if the rings are too tight, I'll just file the gap open a little bit with a small file. And third, I'm going to compare the new piston with the old piston very carefully. This is not OEM part. I couldn't find OEM, but I know the diameter is right because that's what I base the order on. It should fit the bike, but I want to double check overall piston height and the location of the wrist pin with respect to the top surface. If this new piston is just a little bit taller than the old one, or the wrist pin isn't exactly in the same position, I could risk driving this poor thing right up into the cylinder head or the spark plug. Hopefully it goes without saying that's not a good thing. In the off chance that it is a little too long, that's exaggerated. I'd likely take the piston to the bench grinder. I may have to add an additional gasket underneath the cylinder to move it up. Dang it. By whatever amount it takes to have clearance at the top. To check that, I just put a straight edge across the top and use a feeler gauge. I should have a spec for that. And again, I just shim the cylinder up, effectively lowering the piston until I get the clearance that I want. May or may not have to do that, but something to look out for. Well, I'm just back from a test drive. I'm happy with how the thing feels now. No leaks, except I use the wrong goop on the tailpipe, on the exhaust. You see that junk all the way back in there? It just sprayed everywhere, all over my bullets and everything. So if nothing else, I gotta get this muffler and exhaust off, clean that up and put the right junk in there. I just pulled the spark plug, and although this is an old plug and I haven't been able to ride it out much, I thought I'd show you what it looked like. I'm looking at the electrode in the center, and I'm happy to see that it's dry. And there's some carbon on here. Probably time for a new plug, to be honest. But given that I was driving around pretty slow and for not very long, I'm okay with how that looks. All right, it's the moment of truth. Judgment day is upon us. Every day in the United States alone, approximately 893 people have something to say about your cylinder honing decisions. Some of you may have noticed I did not hone this cylinder bore. I didn't touch it. No ball hone, no flex hone, no nothing. I just scrubbed it clean with some hot soapy water. I ain't know the first thing about cylinder honing, but I know one or two things about coatings. Let's just back up a sec. When you have a worn cylinder and you're installing a new piston and rings, traditionally, you'd hone the bore. Classic cylinder hones look like this though you can get flex or ball hones that look like this. You'd run one of those quickly up and down the bore with a drill perhaps. Both do approximately the same job. Recut the old surface a bit, reconditioning the bore if you will. Honing the bore scuffs up the inside surface, knocks off any glaze that may have developed, gives the oil something to hang on to and the rings something to work against. However, this thing has a Nicosil coating. Nicosil is a trade name for a nickel silicon carbide. A very thin layer of that stuff is deposited on the inside. It's what keeps the steel piston rings from just eating the aluminum wall for breakfast. Silicon carbide is extremely hard. A standard cylinder hone will do absolutely nothing to it. Well, except maybe chip and break it right off the aluminum substrate, which is very easy to do in a two-stroke engine with all the ports and harbors in there. So unless you own something like a sun and diamond hone, the only thing you and I at home might be able to do is make a bad situation even worse. If the coating is worn, you have to send it out to someone that knows what they're doing, which is why I didn't touch it. That and the fact that it looked like it had a little more life in it.
Oh, ain't that something? I should have tried this first. This is the other accessory in the kit, or one of the other accessories. My compressor is at 90 PSI. I'm reading about 45. Oh, let me try this with the Sears one. Am I fooling myself here? All right. Why isn't that holding pressure now? Peak reading, I'm seeing about 100, 105. The gauge on the compressor says 90. I think I have my answer. What has this world come to when you can't even trust a tool that you bought for less than what it costs you to walk to the mailbox to pick it up? Let me know down in the comments if I'm mistaken, but I don't even think an engine like this would start with 50, 60, 70 PSI of compression. Minimum viable has gotta be at least 85, 90, 95 PSI. But fact of the matter, bike starts on the first kick. Okay, maybe the second. And it's got a lot more get up and go than it used to, which was the whole point of this exercise. Let me wash my hands and we'll wrap this up. Something to keep in mind after a rebuild like this, the engine does need a little time to break back in. The piston rings haven't yet worn into the new position. The new piston rings in the old bore are probably only touching off on a handful of spots. It's not really getting the seal that it needs. This thing probably needs to be ridden a good, I don't know, 20 minutes, half hour. I only did a quick 10 minute run around the block. I didn't want to be that one knucklehead running around making noise while everybody's locked up inside. Not to mention it's still kind of early. I rode it till the engine came up to temp, till the fan came on. Again, maybe you can see in this shot, the exhaust got hot enough to melt whatever that goop was that I put in there by accident. First impressions are good though. I mean, it's still a 125, but in first gear, de-weight the suspension, pull the throttle all the way open. On a slight incline, the front tire will come up. Before the new rings, it required a bit of a clutch dump to do the same thing. So for a hundred bucks, I think I've made some progress here. Again, it still needs a little bit more break in. I expect it to get a little bit better and I wish I'd done this sooner. Hope you like that. Thanks for watching. Pardon this interruption. It's me, old Tony from the future. I just finished editing this video and I can't believe I wrapped it up without ever starting the bike back up for you. I wouldn't blame you for thinking I was raised by savages. The bike is stone cold. It's been sitting here a couple of days. Let's see how many kicks it takes to get to the center of a... She's doing good. Maybe once this whole thing, it's doing great. Feels like a new bike. Maybe one of these days, once this whole thing blows over, I'll take you out for a ride with me. I know that was long. For those of you who stuck around, thanks for watching.